Hi, my name's Joel Duff, and today I would like to tell you about the amazing killdeer. I've spent a number of years watching killdeer, observing killdeer, photographing killdeer, and I want to share my experiences with you along with my photography. So in this talk, I'm going to introduce you to what a killdeer is. I want to talk about how you can find killdeer and recognize them. I'm going to talk about their amazing distraction techniques, how they hide their nests in plain sight. We're going to talk about why do the females and males look the same. We're going to cover a number of different biological topics at the same time that I am showing you what I think are beautiful pictures of a beautiful bird. So all that coming up and more. So let me introduce you to our spectacular bird, the killdeer. Scientific name, Caradrius vociferus. And you hear that, that uh, specific epithet, the second part of its name, vociferous. Yes, this is a very vocal bird. And once you've heard its vocalization, uh, it's unforgettable. And you'll always be able to recognize a killdeer after that. You don't have to see the killdeer to know a killdeer is around. Um, so... Let's get right into what a killdeer is and put it in perspective in terms of like, what are killdeer similar to? Um, killdeer are a type of shorebird. And so there is a family of birds that share a number of characteristics. I think, um, you know, you might think, well, they live along the shore, right? And they have long legs and they're generally waders. And uh, so they're, they're searching for food along shorelines or along lake li uh, or in lakes. Uh, and But as we're going to see, our particular bird of interest, the killdeer, uh, it can spend time along the beach or along shores, but most of its life it spends far inland, far away from the water, uh, which is a very peculiar sort of habitat uh, for these types of birds. Um, killdeer are plovers specifically. So the Chiradrius, which is a genus, which is a group of birds or a group of species that are similar to each other, all those birds are called plovers. Uh, the plover in this, in this particular picture is in the upper right-hand corner, and then my killdeer here is in the, uh, the bottom left-hand, or sorry, the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so looking at Chiadrius in particular, the, the, the closely related group of birds or bird species called uh, the plovers, uh, we have a number of different plovers that live in different parts of the world. This is just a map from a, a study of some of those plovers uh, and the locations that they study them at. And our bird of interest right over here, let me get my pen out. All right, our bird of interest right here is Chiadrius vociferus. And it is a native of North America uh, and Central America and dips down a little bit into South America, as we can see here. So this is the, the general geographical range of this particular plover. And as you saw in the previous slide, there's, there's actually multiple different species of plovers that live in North America. Uh, Kildare are one of the most widespread of plovers and probably the most common plover uh, in North America. Uh, owing to the fact that it can inhabit a number of different uh, environments. Uh, and so it's not just constricted to, say, shorelines or near, the, near beaches or lakes. Um, here we see that uh, there is a breeding uh, region. And this is just, you can think of this as this is an area where the killdeer will migrate to in the summer um, and uh, do most of their breeding in this, in this region. So they have their chicks. They raise them to the point where they can fly back uh, south. There is an area where there are resident killdeer. Resident killdeers means that they can live there all year round and do the entire breeding cycle uh, without having to migrate very far or at all. And then there is a wintering uh, zone, uh, and this would be an area where you would find killdeer in the wintertime. And typically the killdeer that are found in this region down here are the killdeer that are found in this portion breeding area. Uh, during the summertime. So they are the ones that are migrating uh, back and forth uh, uh, during the year. So these little birds, um, they, um, experience, they as you can see, they cover a broad range, but what kind of habitats would you normally find them in? Like if you wanted to see a killdeer, uh, where would you go in order to observe a killdeer? So what I'm going to do, oh yeah, before I, uh, before I dig into that, I just first want to tell you that all the pictures I'm going to show you are my own photographs. 
Uh, and all of these uh, pictures and more uh, can be found on my photo uh, website at beachnutphotography.com. I will put a link below this video uh, of access directly to the, uh, the gallery that includes all the photos that I'm using today. And all of those are free to download in full resolution for whatever purpose you wish to use them for. I just want to spread the love about killdeer because they're such amazing animals. All right, so I'm going to introduce you to killdeer as in, in a sort of personal way. And, th and that personal way would be like how I got introduced to killdeer and how I gradually got to know killdeer, uh, experience killdeer's behaviors uh, over time. And so, like I said, this has been uh, probably about a six or seven year journey with the last four years being a little more intensive in that I have followed uh, a number of breeding pairs over multiple seasons now. Um, but my first introduction to kill deer was in the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming. I was on family vacation uh, with my, my kids and wife, and we, we had uh, spent a good amount of time in the Bighorn Basin, and, uh, which is a desert, uh, you know, a, a high desert region. Uh, and we were there to collect fossils. Uh, specifically, we were looking for dinosaur fossils. Um, and the place that we were staying was out in the middle of nowhere. And I, I, as I wandered around taking pictures, um, I heard this bird. And I thought, well, I, I don't really remember hearing this bird before. And then I finally spotted this bird. And here's one of the first photographs that I took of a killdeer. Um, and it was this bird was very peculiar to me. It, it definitely caught my eye, not just because of the sound, but because of its behavior. Um, moments after I snapped this picture and I started to walk toward it, this bird ran away from me and began to um, drag its wing on the ground, uh, making all kinds of sound. And so I'm following this killdeer, and I, for a moment there, I thought, I felt really bad for this bird. I thought it had a broken wing, right? And I thought, I thought, what's wrong with this bird? And, and um, you know, I'm trying to get closer to it to see what's wrong. And, of course, every time I get a little bit closer, it scoots a little farther away. But it continues to call for me and so forth. Now, I didn't know what kind of bird this was. And I'm, I've not been to Wyoming too many times. I thought maybe it was a special bird to Wyoming or the western U.S. And I, I, um, I didn't think that much more of it. Uh, at the time, but soon after leaving Wyoming, I was looking at some of my pictures and uh, decided to try to figure out what kind of bird this was and looked it up, found out it was a killdeer, did a tiny bit of reading about it. And it wasn't until weeks later when I started to process my pictures um, that I processed this particular picture and I noticed something. <laughs> I noticed something in this picture that I did not see when I took the picture. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Right here is a killdeer nest, right? This bird was standing next to its nest when I took a picture of it. And then when I walked toward the bird, it ran away and distracted me from finding the nest. And it did a wonderful job of distracting me. I was never aware of the nest's existence. Uh, it, the, the bird basically told me to run off this direction and follow it because it has a broken wing and might be a yummy lunch for me, uh, and protected its, its eggs. And this is one of the really cool things about this bird, and I'm gonna, we're going to explore this a lot more as I go through a number of different pictures uh, uh, and photos of different places where I've observed killdeer, especially here in Ohio. All right, so on that same trip, um, we were in Kansas, uh, heading back to Ohio. And in Kansas, we visited a place called Castle Rocks and a couple other rocky outcrops that are there. And these sites are fairly famous for being um, the remnants of a shallow ocean in the past and so full of different fossils. And so I was there to, um, we were there to check out some fossils. And we're wandering around the area around this, uh, which is this um, kind of gravelly, rocky uh, plain. And as we did so, I heard a sound and I saw a bird and uh, uh, calling to me. And I snapped this shot and here it is exhibiting the broken wing display. Uh, and this, by the way, killdeer aren't the only ones to do broken wing display. I have a I had a dove that was um, 
Uh, there's a number of birds that do this, but uh, I had a dove that was nesting in one of my gutters uh, here at home, and uh, one day I was a little too close to it as I was working on the house, and it flew down from the gutter and onto the grass, and it started to exhibit this broken wing display, right? It's, it's all a distraction method to try to um, protect what's most valuable to these birds, which is their offspring. Um, all right, so this time I wasn't fooled, all right? I said, aha, I know who you are. I know you're a killdeer, and I know that you're trying to distract me from finding your nest. And so there's the bird over there. I told my daughter, okay, this bird is running off at approximately like a 90-degree angle from me. And so if we just trace back uh, from the direction from which it came and just follow that line, there should be a nest somewhere. So I told my daughter, go look over there in that rocky area and see if you can find a nest. And within a few moments, she managed to identify this particular nest. So now you get a glimpse of like, here's where killdeer lay their eggs, just right out in the open. This is what the ground looks like all over the place there. They don't try to hide their eggs underneath a, a little shrub or anything that's in the area. They put them in plain sight. All right, it's like you never think about looking for a nest right below your feet, um, just anywhere out in the open. Um, these, uh, uh, just a, a little side thing here. The, the rocks that you see that are in this uh, nest are actually all fossils. These are also, these are all pieces of broken pieces of fossil clam shells. Um, there were huge clams uh, in this region in the past that were many feet uh, wide. Um, this is the thickness of the, sh the clam shells themselves. And, um, and the, even this red material um, is, is actually a fossilized material. And what's really intriguing about these particular eggs is, of course, you can see the modeled pattern on the surface of the eggs, right? Trying to, trying to mimic the, the, uh, the textures that are on the, on the ground. So let me give you a little closer shot of that. Um, get rid of this ink. I, I even uh, appreciate that you see these little areas here. There's kind of like these little orange spots on the eggs. And those orange spots are very similar to the orangish, uh, you know, iron sort of uh, color uh, in the materials that uh, this this uh, this nest has uh, been built from. And you see, there's not a lot of construction going on with this nest, right? Might have scratched out a little spot, but hasn't brought any material in to sort of comfort the eggs. And this bird needs to incubate, and so the bird's going to be sitting in this spot for a long period of time to incubate these eggs. All right, so that was Kansas, and that was my first time identifying a, a nest uh, with eggs in it. And so it was uh, the next spring. And the next spring, I'm in a park, a public park in Canton, Ohio. Uh, and I'm walking down a railroad track. Um, uh, I'm actually on my way uh, to try to catch my son running in a marathon. So I'm trying to see him in multiple locations and I'm just zipping along this railroad track to try to get to another location to see him. And out of the corner of my eye, I notice there's a bird running away from me. And I, I see a bird like run off to the side. And this is, I'm fairly, I'm actually like probably about 40 feet away uh, at that point, not as close as, as the picture is here. Um, I'm about 40 feet away and I'm walking and all of a sudden I just see a bird, you know, run off to the side that apparently was around the railroad tracks. Uh, and then as I get closer, this bird starts to squawk at me doing the kill DD sound uh, from kill deer is, is uh, the name of kill deer comes from the sound that they make. And it's a very high pitched kill DD, kill DD. Um, I can't do it. You'll have to go to you know, Google up uh, their their voice, and you should do that when you're done watching this video. You should uh, Google up uh, the the voice of the sound of a kill deer because once you hear it, uh, you won't be able to unhear it. And anytime there's a kill deer around, you will know it's a kill deer, and it's great because then you can say, "Ah, there's a kill deer." Even if you don't see it, you'll know that there's a kill deer in your area. Um, so anyway, this this bird runs off to the side, starts to do its broken wing display, and so forth. And I say, "Aha." Ah, there's a killdeer nest, and I'm here in Ohio now, and now there's a killdeer here. And um, I, I, I look back, again, 90-degree angle, back toward in the direction I am walking in this direction. Uh, and, and now I'm showing you a picture of the actual bird on its nest. There is the nest there. So I actually backed up 
uh, and waited a while. Um, actually, I came back uh, to check out this bird the next day. Uh, I came back, and as I was farther away, I took this picture of the bird sitting on its nest prior to me walking close enough that it got off. So here it is. I mean, would you have seen that had I not pointed it out to you that there is a killdeer actually sitting on a nest right by this railroad? And this is a, this is a, a, a path over here, all right? So a lot of people walking by in this particular area, and this is in a public park. Uh, you know, dogs and so forth everywhere. And, and yet this bird has laid its nest here. Now let me show you a little bit more of uh, some other pictures of that. So now I'm looking the, other, the opposite direction. Uh, and here is our nest right here. All right, you can just see the eggs peeking up right here. And look how well camouflaged those eggs are. They just look like the rocks. And then if we look a little closer... And you see, like, here's the eggs. Now, they've actually done a little bit of nest construction here. They've sort of added a little padding around the rocks to <laughs> make it a little more comfortable sitting on this nest. And now here I am looking down on the nest. And so let's, let's make a couple other observations here. One is there are four eggs. That's fairly typical for a killdeer. Um, could be two to four eggs, but they're going to try to lay four eggs unless there's some kind of problem. Um, I mean, if there's not enough resources, you can imagine it takes a lot of resource, a lot of energy in order to make each egg for the size of bird that is laying these eggs. Um, and also, if a nest does get disturbed and say the eggs are destroyed or, they, or the bird needs to abandon the nest for some reason, they'll, they'll immediately try to build a new nest and lay more eggs, but then they're rarely going to lay four eggs because that amount of extra energy is just too much. And so they'll lay, you know, two or three eggs. I've never seen with one egg in it. Um, and by now I've, I've observed at, at least 30 different nests uh, within a five, six mile radius uh, of my home, uh, maybe a 10 mile radius of my home. All right, so I, you know, now that I had identified a killdeer nest um, that's not too far away from where I live, um, I decided I would continue to visit this particular location, right? So I would come back and I took pictures periodically and I would, I would observe the bird's behavior and, uh, and watch the parents. And so uh, it's not just one bird, it's actually two. There's always two. It's always a pair of killdeers that are taking care of the nest. And as we'll see, we're going to talk a lot about um, the fact that killdeer males and females look the same and really can't tell them apart. Um, uh, you know, just looking at them you know, without turning them upside down, looking more carefully. Um, it, we're going to talk about uh, the male and female um, responsibilities in terms of taking care of nests. All right, so here's this nest. I watched it for a couple weeks, and uh, at some at one day I showed up. You know, I had been there the day before. I saw that there were four eggs, and the next day, this is what I saw. All right, so this is me looking straight down on the nest. Uh, the 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 uh, one of the killdeer parents had been sitting on the nest. I walked up. It ran off, uh, and here were four little baby birds, and these have to be brand new hatchlings uh, sitting in this nest. Now, the thing about killdeer. Um, uh, offspring, all right, uh, hatchlings is that they are, they're considered precocious, all right, so the term is precocious for them. Precocious means that they are born ready to go, okay, so this isn't like robins or sparrows or doves or, you know, especially mostly bird, most birds that have um, nests in trees. They have offspring that usually are naked, um, very helpless, uh, have to beg for food, and the parents have to the parent or parents have to continually feed them and raise them to the point where they can leave the nest. In this case, uh, these birds can leave the nest within hours of being uh, hatched. So think like um, like chickens. All right, they they'll hatch out and then they pop up and they're walking around. Uh, the parents can't directly feed these offspring. Um, it's going to be insects and and other kinds of seeds and things like that that they're going to eat. Uh, what the parents can do or do is they lead them to food and they teach them how to find food. So here we have one of them that's popped up. Now, what happened in this particular case is, right, I'm right there. I'm seeing these brand new um, 
um, hatchlings and I am just standing right above them taking a picture. And both parents are, are not terribly happy with me at the moment. They're kind of, they're circling around me, landing, and then talking to me and so forth. And, you know, I, I spent a very brief time here taking these pictures, and then I walked back uh, carefully. And once I got an appropriate distance, about 50 feet away at least, um, and then I just sat down and I watched for a while. And the parents continued to kind of mingle around the area, but wouldn't go over to the nest. And But they were making all kinds of sounds the whole time. And those sounds aren't all directed at me. They're not all warning sounds to me. They're actually warning sounds to the, the new hatchlings. Uh, they are clearly making sounds to give signals to the hatchlings as to what they're supposed to do. And one of those signals is like, stay put, right? Don't move. And then all of a sudden they start making sounds and I see all four of them pop up, right? They got the signal, right? So they innately know, you know, just even as newborns, they know a particular sound means hop up. And they all hop up and they start meandering around. And I started to walk back a little bit toward them in order to get a couple pictures. And as I do, you know, the parents again call to them and they start moving in four different directions, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious that the signal is like, don't stay together, start moving and move in four opposite directions. <laughs> and so I can't follow all of them, right? And so here's one that's, uh, that's running along. And yes, they've probably just come out of the eggs not too much earlier and they can run and they're just bobbing along. And then as they're wandering around, uh, and I'm probably 10, 15, 20 feet away at different times uh, from them as I'm trying to photograph them. I then hear the parents still continuing to chatter away and they make a sound and it's pretty clear that that sound is the hunker down sound again. It's like running away is not gonna do any good. So just sit, all right? And they immediately sit down. I, and I'm only, I only have two in my line of sight at the time. Uh, and both of them just suddenly stop and they just crouch down and they just sit absolutely still, right? They're playing dead. Uh, there is a little baby bird in this particular picture. There's a little baby killdeer and that killdeer is right here. Uh, it always takes me a while to find it when I, when I look at my pictures again. And it took me a while to find it when I walked up on this gravel. I knew it was there, I'd seen it from a distance, but it's, I took my eye off it to look for the other birds and when I moved my eyes back, I couldn't remember where it was. So I had to very carefully come up to this area and I don't want to step on anything. And I'm looking around and eventually I spot um, this little baby chick. So now I'm lying on the ground taking a picture and here he or she is um, in all of their splendor of their little tiny, um, you know, fluffy, just little bits of fluff, right? Like little f beginnings of feathers. Um, no flight feathers, of course, no, uh, I like that. This is just basically like fuzz uh, all over them. But these little chicks, they're ready to go. They're ready to eat. So that's a, a quick introduction to my sort of like introduction to uh, kill deer. Well, what I want to do is I want to go through a variety of different portions of their life and look a little more detail at things. So let's look at some nests and nesting behavior and do some comparisons of that, and then we'll go through their entire breeding uh, cycle uh, and show lots more of pictures of baby uh, killed here because they're just so darn cute. Um, nest and nesting behavior. So there's our four eggs in a nest. And so I just want to show you a variety of nests. So I have uh, spent a good amount of time hunting down uh, killed deer in my, where I live. Uh, and I've gotten pretty good at spotting like where killdeer nests, you know, would be or potentially could be or where a killdeer might like to be. Uh, they require open spaces. They require sort of, um, they love gravel parking lots. Um, I've seen nests in, uh, well, as you're going to see, uh, one of my favorite birds is in a nest that may, is made in a median at a Lowe's Home Improvement uh, parking lot. Um, they, they don't, they don't want any cover at all. Uh, and so anywhere that's, that's going to be, um, uh, they love construction lots. Um, they love, uh, power substations because they have, uh, you know, a lot of gravel there. 
Uh, they love they, they will nest on some flat roofs uh, if you have a gravel roof and so forth. Right. So here's here's an example. Here is a killdeer uh, standing above his or her uh, nest uh, with four eggs. And this is in a school parking lot uh, along the edge of the parking lot. Now, when this killdeer actually made this nest and laid her eggs, she's laying them in early March, um, which is still, you know, I mean, it can snow on, on top of these uh, nests and the, the bird will sit there with a pile of snow around them. Uh, and at that time, there isn't any grass there. So this is uh, the grass is 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 barely uh, growing at all. Uh, and so this looks like a fairly open area to the bird, but now the grass has grown up. Um, that's the same case for here. Um, this particular spot I found to be one of the most unusual places I've, I've found a killdeer nest. Um, there was some construction the fall before at, just alongside this road um, where this is, a, uh, this is a, for a power pole. And they had left a pile of... of rocks there from that construction and the grass uh, was really not growing at all either so when this bird found this site originally it was just like you know some some gravelly rocks uh, with uh, some flat land around it um, she she built her nest here and she and he built her, their nest here and uh, here you can see one of the chicks has just been hatched uh, and the other egg is waiting to be hatched this only had, there are only two eggs here and let me see, show you where this is. So there is one of the killdeer parents sitting on the nest. And I came and visited this killdeer multiple times. Uh, this is a very busy four-lane road. And then there is a walking path right here. And boom, there's the bird. <laughs> he was like, has a nest there. And she successfully hatched two eggs. And in fact, the next year, there was another nest in the same location. Um, this is very close by. This is actually the same road, same walking trail. Um, and that other nest is, is about, you know, maybe 50 yards this direction. Um, so here's a nest right here. And so this is just in, and, and you can imagine earlier in the spring when there wasn't any plants here, this is just an open area, made the nest there, not really knowing that this, all these plants were going to grow up. Here's another, uh, this is actually just a kind of a gravel uh, side parking lot where trucks sometimes park uh, off, off the road. Um, and there are, f oh, I should point out where the eggs are. Here's the four eggs right here, just laying right on top of the ground. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no even digging out a nest. It's just plopping them right on the surface of the ground. Um, Here's another killdeer nest, again, at a park. Uh, and now we have these dandelions growing up around it. And is, in this particular case, this, this park was mowed, this grass was actually mowed probably two or three times while the nest was there. Uh, and it never got damaged, right? The, the eggs are low enough to the ground, right? They're not sticking up enough that uh, the, the blades from the, uh, from the mower never got them. Uh, and the bird just comes back right after the lawnmower goes by and just sits back on the nest. And all four, in this case, this particular year, I watched this one, all four of these uh, hatched out and uh, successfully got to at least the fledgling uh, stage, right? Getting uh, more wings. But I, although I don't know if they actually survived to the point where they could fly away. Here's a nest with three eggs. And I show this one because uh, you can, I'm, I'm, you want you to get a sense too for the, the difference in the uh, coloration of the eggs. Um, and so as I've seen these eggs and other pictures of people's eggs from all across the, uh, the North America, there's quite a bit of variety in the color patterns uh, on the eggs. And you know, there's some question as to how much the birds can actually influence uh, that color pattern, but it seems pretty obvious that they must have some kind of influence over it because um, there's often a, you know, a greater similarity of the pattern to the types of vegetation and materials around it. Uh, so if it's much lighter background, then they have somewhat lighter looking uh, eggs. And if it's a darker background, they have darker eggs. I like this. These particular eggs are awesome because I think they, they kind of have a slight green tint to them. So they really fit into this particular environment. Now, this is one of the most popular places to find um, uh, killdeer eggs. Almost every single power substation in my area has a one pair of killdeer. Um, and so that's their territory. 
and that pair of killdeer and it's a great place to have a, a nest because inside of the power subs you know they usually are surrounded by a, uh, a chain link fence and so they have this nest in here which protects them and they probably don't realize this but they're being protected against a variety of different predators not that they really need that protection because they're just amazing at avoiding predators anyway um, but here they have here's a nest just inside of uh, this um, power substation um, so that's a that's a fantastic place to find uh, kill deer is um, a great habitat for them uh, once again this is this is another set of eggs oh let's go back and look at this one again you see how much lighter those eggs I mean they're big black uh, blotches on them um, and then kind of creamy color and this one is is uh, you know has much they're not the blotches aren't as big there's kind of this greenish hue to it and you see this um, these are lichens uh, which is a moss and a, I'm sorry not a moss an algae and a fungus uh, is what a lichen is and there's just multiple colors in the rocks and debris around here I mean this this nest is really awesome um, here's one that has uh, that's a little bit browner um, this set of eggs is a little bit browner I like this particular set of eggs. Um, this is right around the corner from my house in a field uh, that in the spring is kind of this open field that's been all mowed from the previous year. And there's a lot of gravelly patches in there and sort of dry areas that are going to occur later in the summer. So in other words, it's, it's not very good growth. So it's just weeds out there. Um, but I, I like this one because you see this uh, this yellow uh, set of leaves here and that tells you that these birds spend a lot of time sitting on the nests all right so the male and the female birds uh, that the male and female partners uh, take turns um, incubating the eggs uh, and they're going to need a lot of incubation because this is this is March in northern Ohio uh, and you know it might be nice one day but it also like I said it could be snowing the next day and so there's a lot of wild temperature swings uh, and these eggs have to be kept at some reasonable temperature during their entire uh, incubation period over several weeks. Um, and the, the yellow leaves tell you that big birds do really do sit on these because uh, the reason the, the leaves are yellow is because they're not getting enough sunlight, right? If, you, if a leaf doesn't get enough sunlight, it doesn't produce chlorophyll, which is the green colored pigment. Uh, and so that plant is struggling to make chlorophyll in order to get energy. Okay, so now let's kind of go through the entire breeding cycle so I can talk more about some of the behaviors of kill deer um, typical breeding season and and here this is my experience from Ohio all right so for in Ohio at least my portion of Ohio here in northern Ohio um, I've keep a, a, a for the last five years, I've kept a log of when do I hear my first kill deer. And I've kind of gone around to various areas where kill deer um, will come and uh, will end up taking up residence uh, for a while. And so I know where they're going to be or where they like to be. And so I'll just drive through those areas and I look for kill deer. But more particularly, I'm listening for kill deer because they just can't be quiet. They, they really just can't. I mean, they just... Um, it, it, there can be times when there's a group of them and they're not making any sound, but as soon as they start moving, they start making sounds. Uh, when they fly, they make sounds. I, if they fly over your head, they're going to be making some sound, uh, which is distinctive. And so I know right away when I hear a kill deer. Uh, and so I've marked down when the earliest date is that I hear a kill deer. And it's, it's variable, but remarkably... Um, variable in the sense of about a week difference um, last week of February uh, is typically when I'm hearing them and it kind of doesn't matter whether it's like terrible weather or whether it's a uh, really good weather they, they seem to be coming back around that time and then the males at least what I think are the males uh, as because it's hard to tell them apart uh, they'll scratch off these little uh, you know fake nests or um, you know nesting possible sites and I don't know if this is a like show off type thing to the females like here, like look at this. I can I can help you make a nest type of thing. But, you know, I found multiple locations where I see the birds kind of, you know, goofing around and uh, I'll find these sort of little clearings, um, which would be a place where you could lay four eggs. So they're like making possible nest locations uh, for the females. 
Now, in some cases, this might be uh, ways of trying to induce or entice different females for breeding opportunities, right? Um, but in many cases, uh, the males are already uh, taken, all right? The, the females and males uh, pair up, and um, many of them, uh, there's some evidence that, that many of them are paired for life. You know, they'll, they'll be the same pair over multiple years, so they... They have a nest, they take care of the eggs, they raise the young, they all fly off, uh, migrate back south, and the same two will come back and do it again in the exact same location. It's really an amazing thing to see the same pair of birds show up in the same exact spot the next year and even make a nest in the exact same location multiple years in a row. Um, and so here we go with, um, I have very few pictures of, of both parents, all right, the male and the female together. Um, although they hang out in the same area, they aren't frequently staying, they aren't frequently, don't frequently stand right next to each other. So I got this picture of what I'm quite certain is a pair of killdeer because they're the, they were the only two in this particular area that's sort of their, um, their territory. Uh, and I know where their nest is, and I've seen both of them back and forth uh, to that nest. So I'm sure this is a male and a female. Now, which one's the male and which one's the female, I'm not sure. I think that the one on the right side is the female, and the other one on the left side is the male, um, based on just the slight difference in this second um, band here. And th th there's some... People that have looked at a lot of kill there suggested that, that you can use the differences in that second band to tell the difference between the male and female. And sometimes there's a weight difference, but not always. Uh, so it's very hard to tell them apart. Um, and this is different than maybe a lot of birds that you might think of, right? You think of like, well, when you get chickens, you have a rooster and you have hens and they're complete. The male looks completely different than the female. Uh, and you have, uh, say, um, I'm trying to think about like cardinals, right? You have a, a bright red cardinal, that's the male, and then the female is a little more drab looking. Uh, and that's true for a lot of birds. And so we're going to talk a little bit later about um, the biology of why some birds look the same, males and females look the same, and why do some birds have very different looking, um, uh, they're called well, dimorphism or different looks for males and females. All right, now here's the only picture in which I can tell you which one's the male and the female because here's the really one of only two pictures that I have of, of mating. Um, and so obviously the male's on top in this case. And so here's a pair of killdeer that are mating. And here we have a killdeer standing next to its nest. Now, uh, ne next to its nest. And I'm, I'm being careful not to say she or he because Again, I don't know whether this is a she or a he. Both are rather, are very attentive um, to the nest. There's some evidence in the literature that the female might be a, a little more invested in the nest than the male. And I feel like I've seen that as well because um, I've gotten to know a couple of these pairs very well because I've spent a lot of time with them, you know, just sitting down a little ways from them and just watching and getting them really used to me so that I can get very close to them, as you're going to see in a moment. Um, and so I, I, I feel like I have observed um, cases where one of the birds is more skittish than the other. One is more protective of the nest than the other. One's more willing to leave the nest. And the other one's more willing to defend the nest. And I suspect that's the female being a little bit more protective than the male, but it's still rather remarkable how dedicated uh, the male is to um, all the nesting activities, uh, helping with the nest, and then eventually helping with the fledglings, uh, uh, the hatchlings, um, get their food. So here, this, this particular one has two eggs, and this was another case where I know that this particular pair had laid a nest. This is in a parking lot, again, of a, of a school. Uh, and so, you know, it's fairly busy sometimes of the day. Uh, and this particular bird had had its nest disturbed and so abandoned its first nest attempt and then made the second one and so only laid two eggs. Um, here is possibly the same bird, but maybe the other pair 
the other bird of the pair, uh, standing on his or her nest. Uh, in, in this case, um, having their, their feathers ruffled up, trying to look bigger than they really are and making a lot of noise looking at me. In this case, I'm actually taking a picture from, uh, I'm taking a picture from my car. Uh, I driven by and I'm just holding my camera outside the window of the car taking a picture. It, the remarkable thing is they don't care about cars at all. Uh, you know, if I drive up, they don't make, don't make, don't seem to even notice the car until I lower the window. And then if I put my hand out uh, and they see my head outside the window, as long as I'm completely inside the car, no problem. Uh, as soon as I'm out of the car, then it's sort of like, oh, well, there's something going on here. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but this particular bird typically doesn't leave its nest, though, even even if uh, even if disturbed. So let's show you some defensive displays. All right, so here's a, a bird, and actually um, his or her nest is right behind uh, this bird, and so I'm I'm probably about 15 feet away. And um, it's rearing up, right? And then it's displaying its tail feathers, which look very different in this display than they do just normally walking around. Um, you know, just trying to like ward me off. And then as soon as I get any closer, gonna make a dash either to the right or to the left, not toward me and not back. It's always gonna be like a, basically a 90 degree angle with respect to where, to, to my approach angle. Um, and they're gonna get, then they're going to start doing the other displays, right? The broken wing display, uh, a lot of different kinds of chatter and so forth in order to try to distract me uh, from the nest. Um, here's this bird that's in the, uh, out in the dandelions, um, hunkered down. I love that picture. Here's a killdeer that is fluffing out its uh, breast feathers as it begins to settle down on its nest. Uh, here we have a killdeer sitting on his or her nest, uh, and I just like this picture because here's a dove that I, I, you know, I've been sitting there quite a while. And in order, to, I'm not a bird photographer, and I've always been frustrated by birds because they're they're hard to photograph. They they really are, and I'm a I'm a landscape and uh, botanical photographer. Um, you know, plants sit still for you uh, unless it's really windy. And so I've never really gotten into photographing birds, but this, I really love photographing the killdeer. They're great. <laughs> They're great for photography because they, they sit still and uh, you can get, they can get used to you uh, if you're willing to spend enough time with them. I sat here long enough that even a, a dove that was in the area managed to walk by in front of my lens. So I was able to get these two birds together. The killdeer doesn't care one bit about these other birds walking by. So now we have, here's a fairly aggressive display, uh, this kill deer, um, you know, spreading its wings out, uh, vociferously calling uh, at me. Um, here is an even more aggressive display. This is a bird at a power substation. Uh, I'm probably about 15, 20 feet away from his or her nest, and um, they're flying around. Uh, swooping down and then suddenly rearing up uh, with their wings, um, spreading out their tail feathers, uh, making it look like they're going to charge at me, although I've never had one uh, really ever come within, say, 10 feet of me in terms of, of, of when they're upset. Here's the broken wing display. And so this bird is crouching on the ground and usually making kind of a, a chitter-chatter sound, you know, not the kill DD sound, but more of a, a whiny sort of like, oh, oh, I'm hurt, you know, woe is me. Um, look at, you know, I, you know, I, you know, watch me, eat me, don't find my eggs. Um, now that was the broken wing display from the bird in Kansas. And you look how similar these birds are. I mean, this is a bird from Ohio, and this is one living in Kansas. Uh, you know, so genetically, you know, killdeer living all over North America. Uh, from what I've observed, they're very similar morphologically, meaning their external appearance, but also their behavior is just spot on, you know, every time I, I see them. So um, as I describe them, as I read about them in the literature, it's, uh, you know, it's very consistent. All right. So they're all genetically closely related to, to one another. Now, 
Now I want to introduce you to really, it's got to be my favorite bird, uh, killdeer. Uh, and I say that because I've spent the most time with this particular bird, or I should say this particular pair of birds. Um, and this pair of birds has made its nest in the gravel median of, of a low in a Lowe's parking lot, a uh, Lowe's home improvement store parking lot. And this particular pair of birds uh, has made a nest in this same uh, median four straight years all right so i this is one of this i think this is about the fourth nest uh killed that i had identified i just happened to be i was going to lowe's and i was driving through the parking lot and i saw a kill deer running along the road and uh i then got out and then waited long enough that i saw that it returned back to its nest identified its nest and so forth from that right and then started following it because it's only a mile from my home and this particular bird um, he like said, is, has this particular pair, I think it's the same pair that's coming back to the same location. And three out of the four years, they've had successful nests, um, meaning that they've had hatchlings and little tiny killdeer running all around the, uh, kill, the Lowe's parking lot. Um, now, you might be wondering at this point, like, how did I get pictures like this, right? How did I get it? You know, I, this is like ground level shot of this bird from up close. I am not using some super long length lens um, to take these pictures. I'm using a 300 millimeter lens, but I'm really quite close to this bird. And let me show you how close I am. Here I am. That's me taking this picture, All right? So I had a friend uh, take a picture of me. Who, he's actually a fair distance, uh, a little bit farther away. Um, but that's a picture of me taking a picture of this bird and you can see the bird is actually standing above its nest right here's here's its eggs right now so this brings me to another observation uh, about these birds so when the birds first lay the eggs um in early march um i have i have found that if you if i were to come within 25 feet of the bird they'll just run away they just run away from the nest and then they start squawking and doing their thing um, but as the weeks go by and we're getting very close to the eggs being ready to hatch, it seems like they have a sense for, Hey, you know, I'm really close to being successful here. Having, having a, a batch of, of hatchlings, um, the closer we get, the more resolute the birds come to protecting that nest. Uh, and they're more willing to just stick it out right there at the nest and defend the nest directly rather than indirectly by moving away from the nest. And so at this point, we're only a couple days away from these eggs hatching. And this bird also is, I'll, I'll say, knows me quite well because I've spent a lot of time just sitting in the median. And I know it's kind of weird because there's people driving around. They're like, who's that crazy person sitting in the median at Lowe's? And you no, know, actually quite a few people have stopped and talked to me and said they noticed you know, these birds making all kinds of sounds and wondering what they were. And, you know, and then we, I tell them about them. And then it, one, one day I was talking to somebody and that nest was only like eight feet away. And during our conversation, these, this, uh, this killdeer came back and sat on its nest right in front of us, you know, just got used to us being there. And I was like, okay, going back to the nest because I need to incubate because we're getting really close to hatchling time. <laughs> it's like, um, all right. So, I've spent a lot of time just sitting a ways away and then gradually creeping a little closer, you know, over time to the point where at some point I'm only sitting 10 feet away. And after them being agitated for five or 10 minutes, they'll calm down and just sit there. And it's as if I'm not there at that point. Um, all right. So here's the same parking lot uh, median. And there are three hatchlings now in this nest. Uh, this is a different year uh, because the, before the picture had four eggs, but this particular year they had three eggs. Uh, and there are three hatchlings here, and here they are right here. All right, so they are there sitting in their nest. They'll come back to the nest, even if they've gotten up and run around. Um, they may come back to the nest in the first, say, 48 hours. Uh, but after that, it's pretty much on their own. And the parents are going to generally draw them away and take them toward, 
you know, some place where there's going to be better food supply. Uh, and so they're going to take them off into some grassy field. They're also going to have to try to take them to somewhere where they can get a drink. All right, so uh, undoubtedly, part of what the adults have done is they they know the area, right? And so as soon as they're born, they basically lead them to these areas. Um, all right, so now cute pictures of killdeer babies. All right, and this is these are my my friends from the Lowe's parking lot, um, and. This is where I've got my best pictures there because they're so, oh, I'm not going to say they're comfortable with me, but um, they certainly are aware of my existence and much calmer than the other killdeer that I follow. And so here we go with this cute little baby right here. Look at this little little wing right there. <laughs> you know, it's like just a little fuzz on an arm. And, you know, there you can see that what's inside of a bird's wing is just, you know, this is a, this is a little arm with the, the fingers are down here. Um, oh, by the way, there's another bird. Here's another killdeer right here. All right, and so here's mama or daddy uh, protecting um, those birds. Oh, there's another one right back here, too. I forgot. So here's another one back here. So they're all kind of gathering around. Uh, and so every, especially in the evenings when it's cold and so forth, they're still going to sit there and uh, on these birds. All right, now I wasn't sure where to talk about this, so I threw this uh, slide in and to force me to talk about um, this topic of males versus females and uh, whether what determines uh, when you have very different morphologies or appearances of males and females and what under what conditions do you have males and females that look the same. And so there's a whole body of literature, of theory, about um, what determines um, the differences between sexes. And birds have been studied extensively uh, in this. So there is a process called uh, sexual selection. Um, and in strong sexual, or, or in sexual selection, where there is different natural selection for different traits in males and females, that's why you're going to get different characteristics in males and females. In other words, if, if females are looking at males and they choose traits of males that the female doesn't need, eventually you're going to have males that have characteristics that females don't have. Uh, and that can be vice versa. But it typically in this case, in most cases, the birds, it's the females that are making mate choices. Uh, they're determining which male is going to uh, mate with them. Uh, rather than the males determining the, that. Uh, and so in this particular case, uh, I'm showing you what many people envision when they, when they look at, at birds and they think of these really dramatically colored males, all right, um, compared to the more drab colored females. So what's happening here? These are pictures I took of wood ducks, which are living no more than 200 feet away from one of my killdeer nests. Uh, and on the left side, these are the these are the males, all right, and they're the ones that that people think of when they think of wood ducks, right, because they have this spectacular coloration. And then on the left side, we have a female wood duck. Now, what's going on here? All right, let me tell you about their particular life cycle, uh, and because I'm going to contrast that then with the kill deers, which have males and females that look the same. So in this case, females are choosing males and they also invest more in their offspring, All right? So what does the male do? The male is uh, competing to be the mate for the female. So the males are essentially competing with all the other males and they're trying to catch the eye of the female. Right. And it's not just the pretty colors aren't just like, oh, I'm attractive. Pretty colors mean something else, all right? There's, there's, a, there's a number of studies that suggest that the dark colorations are signs of health, all right? They're an external evidence of the health of the male. Right? What, if you're a female, if you're a female wood duck, what are you interested in in terms of like what you're going to mate with and what your offspring are going to be like? You want your offspring to be healthy, all right? You want your offspring to be well fit for their environment. So how are you going to tell whether you're going to, how do you make a fit offspring? Well, you need to find a fit partner, right? 
And so if you look at all the males, how do you tell which male is healthier than others? Well, in some cases, males, and this happens in other animals, males may have to compete with each other. And the winner of that competition, like, you know, the rams running against each other and like, you know, eventually one of those rams is the strongest. And um, that because they're the winner, that suggests that they were able to procure food more easily. They have better muscle structure. They're a little bigger. They're, in other words, they're just, they they're seem to be healthier. And that might be one of the reasons they're the winner of that competition. And then if you mate with that winner, chances are you're going to pass those particular genes that were better in the environment down, right, to your offspring. So now in the case of these ducks, right, these ducks are, um, they're really colorful. And they don't necessarily fight with each other for females. They're just you know, extremely vibrant. And this is true for a lot of birds, where you look at the male birds, they're very, very vibrant. To make vibrant color, you have to be very healthy. All right, if, if you are not healthy, if you're not getting enough food, if for some reason, genetically, you just aren't uh, as fit for the environment, it's going to be harder for you to make this really dense coloration. And so if the female has an eye for the darkest colors, all right, then she's essentially picking the healthiest uh, duck. And there's another thing that's going on with a lot of birds, and that is uh, the female wood duck uh, will have multiple uh, partners. She'll have multiple mates. So she may mate with multiple of the, the, the male wood ducks. Uh, and then, as weird as this sounds, um, her body can choose which sperm she'll allow to um, fertilize her eggs. And so she knows which of the males she's made with, whereas the males, they might think that they're all, you know, like they've mated with the female, but they actually can't know whether the offspring are theirs or not because there have been multiple partners, and so the male can't be sure that those offspring are theirs. Now, what does this result in? What this results in is a, is a pattern that's seen in many birds where the males, um, they don't know whether these offspring are theirs, and it, it, that gives them less incentive to take care of the offspring. It gives them less incentive to help out, right? So if they... And that's what these wood ducks do. They don't help at all. That's what a lot of, a lot of really, um, if you look at, at birds that have striking difference between males and females, the males often don't have any investment in, the, in anything after the sperm production. Right? They are just, uh, to put it fairly crudely, they're actually just sperm delivery devices. Uh, and once their job is done, they don't have any more, they don't have any use. And you kind of look at the situation, you might, you might also be asking yourself, I mean, isn't it kind of dangerous to be like super brightly colored like that in your environment? You know, you, you know it's understandable why the female is not as dramatic in appearance because she's the one that's going to lay the eggs. She's going to sit on the nest. So she needs to be protected. She needs to blend in with her environment to survive like the killdeer do. Uh, and then when she has young, she needs to protect them as well. And you notice that all the young also are, have drab coloration. They blend in with their environment. Some of those are males. Some are females. They're not going to get, the males aren't going to get their wild coloration patterns until they mature. And at that point, that's when they need to attract a mate. Um, but at that point also, when they get that coloration, it is true. They are in more danger of being uh, taken down by a predator. Uh, if you measure the lifespans, uh, the lifespan of the female is going to be longer than the average lifespan of the male. But let's face it, you only need a few males, right, when the female is willing to have, uh, you know, to mate with multiple different males or multiple females in the area will have the same male uh, partner. In that case, males are kind of expendable. And because they're expendable, they can, you know, it doesn't matter that they have these wild and crazy characteristics. All it does is serve them to get to the point of, of having, uh, uh, being able to uh, share their genetics uh, with uh, the other females. All right, so in this case, natural selection, uh, it, you know, selects for traits that are best for survival of both species, right, both sexes, right? And 
the best features for a male are to have characteristics that allow them to tell the female, I'm really healthy, like I'm a survivor, right? And the best characteristics for the female are to be like less dramatic and to be more interested in the long-term success, right? Long-term survival of both herself and for uh, her offspring. So that brings us back to killdeer. Why do they look the same? Give you something to look at while I'm talking about, uh, b about killdeer and the parents looking the same. So if you see two birds that, uh, at, that are males and females and they look identical, you can make a prediction about how they go about their business, all right? <laughs> what their life cycle is like. If they look the same, chances are they're both very invested in the offspring, all right? The male needs to be around, all right? In this case, the killdeer is living in a, in a, in a high-risk uh, environment. Uh, and because it's a high-risk environment and uh, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of energy to incubate these, um, the, these eggs, they're going to both have to take care of the offspring once they're born. Uh, to protect the, the nest, you need both of them available, right? One of them is sitting on the nest. The other one is essentially watching the nest all the time, also eating in order to keep its energy levels up. So half the day the male is on the nest, about half the day the female is on the nest. This has all been uh, studied and researched. People have watched these birds and made notes for long periods of time, and it's almost an even split between the male and the female. They take on all the same duties. Because they take all the same duties on, the same natural selection pressure is upon both of them. And so they both need to be equally able to avoid predation. And so their color patterns are what works best in that particular environment for protecting them. They're not, one of them is not gonna be larger than the other. They're not gonna have different behaviors than each other. They're going to be very similar because they are both needed for uh, the future of the offspring. Uh, and so when you look at birds, so say look at say, something like robins, all right? Robin uh, females and males are slightly different, but they're really pretty similar. Uh, in that case, both the male and the female are taking care of the young. They're both helping out uh, in that process. Uh, look at uh, Canadian geese. It's hard to tell the difference between the males and the females, but they share, right? They share duties. The male and the female share duties for the, with the nest, and then they both share duties, and, and, and they also have higher fidelity. And so that's the other thing that comes along with this. Um, if you have the sexes look very different, uh, in birds, chances are the males have very low fidelity with the females, or more appropriately, I guess you could say, females have less fidelity, you know, for, for the males. Um, they are just going to choose among the males each season. In fact, they might choose multiple males. Uh, and so the male doesn't really know whether they're, whether the offspring are theirs. You know, if, if they don't know the offspring is theirs, then they don't have incentive to stick around and help out. And so the strategy there is the female just does everything. And she's sure, you know, the female knows that the offspring are her, have her genetics. And so she's very dedicated to them. Uh, for, so when you look at birds that are the same between male and female, almost always they have a shared bond where, they're, where there's fidelity between the two, where they only have a single mate. And sometimes those are mates for life, right? For, I mean, uh, geese are that way too. I mean, it can be multiple years where the same geese, they fly south together, they come back together, they, have, they raise their young together again, and then they do it year after year. Um, and so, and, and that's has been studied in killdeer and in plovers. Plovers in general have pretty high, fi, you know, fidelity, um, single pair partnerships. Uh, and killdeer are very high up on there. Uh, they're very dedicated to this, um, this, this pairing off. And so as you see killdeer come back and migrate, they'll come in groups. But as soon as they come into an area, it's very obvious they're already paired, right? They are already like sets. Uh, and they will go then to different territories uh, and they'll stick together that whole time. All right, so more, um, more babies, all right? And, and the, the fledglings, uh, so a couple things about um, the fledglings. Um, I have never been at a nest site when, the, when, the, when one of the eggs is actually hatching. Um, and I've made a lot of attempts uh, to, to watch them. So I think they're actually happening very early in the morning at times. Um, this one has just very recently hatched out, still kind of moist. 
and so it's it's drying its its little fluffy feathers. Uh, but again, as like I said, these are ready to hop up and go. And the other thing you see is there's no pieces of eggshell anywhere. Um, I've never seen a piece of eggshell in a nest. There can be one egg sitting next to us. So for, here's an example. Here's one egg sitting next to a newly hatched bird, and yet there's no piece of egg anywhere. So what happens is this: the kill deer, as soon as it's hatching or as it's hatching, I assume I can't, I haven't actually witnessed this. Um, she's, she or he is taking away the pieces of the eggshell and dropping them far away. And the idea there would be that um, the inside of the eggshell might have more of an odor uh, as, as the hatching occurs. And so they're trying to avoid predation, trying to avoid any kind of scent. And so I've never been able to collect any of the pieces of the eggshell. I always marvel at pictures like this, all right? You know, so here's, here's this egg. And I'm just amazed that, uh, you know, this animal, and look at the size of the feet on this animal. It's so out of proportion. That's what's so, that's what's so funny about the, these, uh, these little chicks is these absolutely enormous wading bird legs that they have. But imagine this whole thing has to be wrapped up inside of this egg, you know, uh, and then burst forth, you know, and, and there it is. Incredible. Here is my, uh, uh, my school parking lot bird uh, sitting on, you can see these two little, two little heads sticking out here, right? Two little cuties right there. Um, and she's still kind of incubating them and protecting them. So here we have them running around. I just, you know, those legs are just amazing. I mean, the leg feels like it's, uh, you know, a, a fourth of their body total weight must be in their legs. Um, here's my daughter holding a, a fresh little hatchling that had been running around. So we were walking around and picked her up, uh, him or her up. And I'm not advising that uh, you uh, play with uh, kill deer chicks. We're very careful. Um, you know, I allowed her to pick this one up for just a few moments and then we set uh, it back down. Um, but I will tell you that this isn't a situation like you, you probably have heard that, hey, you shouldn't ever like bother like birds in a nest, uh, especially uh, nests in a tree, you know, because the, the, if the parent smells you on them, they might abandon the birds. Um, that's not going to be the case uh, with kill deer. Um, they're, the, the parents have you know, they're just sitting there waiting, and as soon as you put them down and walk away, the, the birds, they'll give the call, and the bird will hop up and run right underneath the parents. Um, these are very, and besides, they're, they're very independent birds already being precocious, and this is the way with, I think, with almost all precocious birds. It's like you can, you know, kids play with uh, little chicks from, uh, from chickens uh, all the time, and it doesn't bother the parents. Uh, I'm not espousing playing with uh, kill deer chicks, uh, but I am I am saying that uh, you know an appreciation of kill deer and uh, being able to to see them in nature and watch them uh, is is a good thing in in, in limited doses. All right, don't want to stress these birds out too much. Here's one walking through the water, so our wading bird here, and here I am holding one of these little guys. Uh, yeah, look at those look at those claws. Wonderful. Right. And usually when when holding them, they're they're completely silent. Uh, they're basically just absolutely still. And the parents are just saying, hey, stay still, stay still, stay still. Um, set them down. They won't try to run away. Um, they just sit there until they get the command. Right. They need to hear the signal um, from the parent that it's OK. So here's the progression. So if I come back to the same location, um, these birds usually don't stray very far from where they're originally born. They're usually staying in the same area. And so within, say, 50, maybe 100 yards at most, I can always find the offspring somewhere in that particular area. But it's hard. It's really hard to find them because as I approach the area, of course, the parents are just, they may not be directly with the birds, although they're often kind of like hanging out in the general vicinity of them. Um, as I approach it, I'll hear the parents, if they see me, you know, they'll start calling and they'll be telling the birds either to come or run, or at some point when I get close enough, they basically give the signal to like, hey, sit down, like just stay quiet and stay in one spot. Uh, and as soon as that happens, uh, I know you can see this bird very easily, but 
it's amazing how hard it is to see them once they kind of fold their wings and sit down in this grass uh, and they sit really still. And I know they're within, I know they have to be around me somewhere and I can search and search and search and search. And sometimes I, I never can find them, you know, I know that they're there. Uh, well, this one right here, you know, I, I had kept my eye on it the entire time as I'm walking over that area. And then I heard the birds call, tell them to sit. And I just kept my eye on that exact spot, walked over there and found this little fledgling. So now we have, look at you have these uh, little flight feathers that are starting to grow here. All right. They're extending out. The, the, these are the shafts of, of the feathers coming out. Tail feathers are really um, not much at all here. So here, and oh, by the way, this is about a, a week and a half old um, uh, killdeer. And then here we have about a two and a half week old killdeer, and we've got some nice uh, feathers on the wings now. Uh, and you know the head has expanded quite a bit. Um, still kind of a darker coloration on the head, so it's still got the colors that would help it blend in with its environment well. Um, tail feathers are still a work in progress. Uh, this bird can't fly. Um, this is a bird from a few, I think that could be the same bird from a few days later. And so in this case, I, you know, this one was sort of jumping and flapping its wings and trying to get away, um, but couldn't fly yet. I would say it's just a few days away from maybe being able to fly. Um, the tail feathers are still uh, actively in the process of growing, but the wing feathers are pretty much about there. So here we are back to our our little killdeer is one of my favorite pictures of my favorite killdeer parent um, standing next to um, this little baby chick. Um, and if you look at other pictures of plovers, of other species of plovers, they generally plovers have similar behavior types. Um, they, they lay their eggs in similar situations. They look kind of similar. Um, but the killdeer are just especially adept at um, being around people. Uh, most of the other plovers um, live in groups, um, maybe on shores of lakes. Um, but these particular birds have managed to somehow conquer inland areas, despite being uh, related to um, shorebirds. And so, like I said, I've, I've shown you pictures where they're in the deep desert. Um, and they're just anywhere, anywhere there's sort of waste areas. And... One of the remarkable things about them is they're not they're not at all rare. In fact, they've probably there are probably more killdeer in North America right now than there have been in, in thousands of years. Well, maybe ever because um, their habitats are have actually grown. There's actually more habitat space for killdeer than there was in the past. If I think about a place like Ohio, I mean Ohio is just completely covered with you know, a thousand years ago would have been just completely covered with a forest. And these birds do not inhabit the forest. They don't inhabit swamps. They don't inhabit, you know, the, even along lakes because they're not going to make their nests in the reeds or in, in thick areas of vegetation. They only make their nest out in the wide open space. Um, so they need disturbed areas. Well, humans are very good at disturbing areas, right? They're, they're very good at, at creating uh, waste areas. Uh, they love gravel parking lots, uh, construction sites. Like I said, um, you know, it's like every substation for an electrical substation probably has a killdeer um, uh, uh, population there. Um, I've seen them make nests out in baseball fields, right, and on soccer fields and uh, in, it, in the gravel around an um, olive garden. Um, it's, it, they're, they're very uh, adept to handling people. Um, and disruptions. They don't mind cars. They don't mind traffic. They, you know, so they're 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 good in semi-urban areas, right? But especially in um, uh, in suburbs. And so, in a way, they have a lot more habitat uh, than these birds would have had in the past. And so, there are a lot of killdeer. And now that I'm aware of killdeer, can hear killdeer, and have seen killdeer, I see and hear them all the time. Uh, and my kids will immediately tell me when we're sitting at a baseball game, like, oh, I just heard a killdeer go by. Uh, and so don't forget, go Google and find a recording of a killdeer uh, and listen to that. And once you listen to that, you'll never forget the sound of a killdeer.
So that's the, the wonderful world of killdeer. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed my um, exploration of these birds. I feel like there's so many things I've forgotten to say, but um, I hope that gave you a taste of, of the, the, the features of a killdeer, the habits of a killdeer, um, and just how wonderful these birds are. They're very special creations, and I just uh, I very much appreciate them. So again, my name's Joel Duff, and um, I'm a biologist uh, by training. I don't study kill deer, but uh, I, I love observing them. And it's just been a great joy to take pictures of them over the last few years. And so I'm glad to have been able to share that with you. Uh, again, my pictures at, are at beechnutphotography.com. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, I'll have some similar, I, I talk a lot about different science topics. Uh, here. So subscribe to my YouTube channel and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye-bye.